5,700 farmers forced to have their homes demolished, their farmland also destroyed. Under threat, farmers fight for their rights. The U.S. designated the Confucius Institute Center a foreign mission of the Chinese regime. The state-funded language centers have been accused of exporting Chinese censorship to U.S. campuses. It's not a good time for Chinese listings. The SEC is investigating Chinese Netflix ITE over fraud allegations. And a Chinese jewelry group is voluntarily delisting itself from the Nasdaq after a scandal broke out that is involved in one of China's largest loan frauds. And U.S. banks earned over $400 million in fees from Chinese listings this year. And in the confrontation between the free world and communist China, Taiwan, a small democratic island, plays a critical role. It is taking a tougher stance towards the Chinese Communist Party for several reasons. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The forced demolition work in the county of Shandong province involved 5,700 homes of farmers and their families. The farmers are fighting for their rights. They and their lawyers suffered threats and were even accused by the authorities. 5,700 houses of farmers and their families in Liangcheng City, Shandong province, have been demolished since June. Eighty percent of the farmers didn't agree with it, but under various kinds of threats, most of them signed an agreement. The houses of 30 farmers who did not sign the agreement were demolished anyway. On Thursday, a villager posted on Weibo saying there are no documents to demolish their homes and the authorities deliberately destroyed farmland, orchards and sheds. He asked, who gives them the right? Another villager posted a video on Weibo at the end of July saying the villagers went to their fields in the morning and were shocked by the scene in front of them. The corn that was still green the day before was torn down and shattered by large machinery. Local governments took over the land in the name of building a high-speed railway. This is a project with a total investment of $7 billion that requires over 3,000 acres. According to China's land management law, if local governments want to expropriate farmers' land, they need to produce official documents to confirm that the land has been converted from collective land to state-owned land. However, the local government skipped this procedure and sent a so-called task force directly into the village using coercive methods to get the villagers to sign a voluntary demolition agreement. Lawyer Li Gang, the director of Beijing Taiwei Law Firm, is one of the villagers' lawyers. He told us the local authorities are using different means to threaten the villagers. Beating people, shutting down their water and electricity, breaking into private houses, harassing people in the middle of the night with dozens of people knocking on your door, different kinds of intimidation. These methods are used in the demolition process. In the end, most of the villagers signed the agreement because they could not bear it anymore. The house of Miss Wang, a villager, was demolished last month. She did not sign the demolition agreement. For that, she was detained for 24 hours. So far, she has not received any compensation. We have not seen any documents for land acquisition. When they demolished the house, if we were to take photos or video, we would be beaten. Two lawyers are helping villagers to defend their rights, but they were accused by authorities. Last week, lawyer Li Gang wrote on his Weibo, It's really shameless that they accused lawyer Wang Dawei and me of sensationalizing rumors. Reporting by Xiong Bin, Bao Ni, NTD News. Now we take a look at China's continued flooding. For days, the upper reaches of the Yangtze River inside China's southwestern Sichuan province has been battered by heavy rains. On Thursday, most of the rivers in the area exceeded their overflow warning levels. Chengdu, Sichuan's capital city, has become severely waterlogged. The man who captured this clip explained it was taken in Pujiang County of Chengdu City and emphasized how terrible the flooding has been. The clip shows one bridge nearly submerged by rushing water. In another, he explained that this flooding building is actually a hospital. While he spoke, an ambulance was being washed away by the current. And in another area, said to be the highest local ground level, was also flooded. Still another video shows how a large area of city streets now function as a lake.
Trees and traffic lights are the only objects poking out of the high water. There are no cars in the area anymore as only boats can sail across it. According to a Chinese media report on Thursday, the water level of the Yangtze River's Chongqing section soared an additional 16 feet within 24 hours. The river there now reaches nearly 600 feet. Chongqing is a special district that neighbors Sichuan province. Elsewhere, the Three Gorges Reservoir saw a peak flood level of nearly 2 million cubic feet per second on Friday. That says the Three Gorges Dam faces pressure ahead of its incoming fourth wave of flooding. The flooding continues to prompt more and more destruction. In one video, a cargo ship was pushed off course by the strong flood currents and smashed into a construction bridge. The ship sank and the bridge was destroyed. It's unclear if anyone was on board. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo signed a joint declaration with Slovenia, which bars untrusted vendors from their 5G networks. Pompeo says the declaration helps protect Slovenia from threats coming from authoritarian regimes. The U.S. and Slovenia signed a joint declaration that excludes untrusted vendors from their 5G networks. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Slovenia has now secured protection against authoritarian threats from regimes like the Chinese Communist Party. Among those threats is the Chinese Communist Party and its drive to control people and information and our economies. He added that free nations should work together to confront these threats. Pompeo praised Slovenia's support for EU sanctions and said it is imperative for Europe to keep its energy sources diverse. We believe it is incredibly important for American national security that Europe have a diversified energy base, that it has multiple sources, that it doesn't have to depend for Russia on all of its energy. We don't think that's wise for any country. The talks come as part of a tour of four European countries and the U.S.'s campaign across Europe and elsewhere against Huawei and other Chinese companies. The Trump administration accuses these companies of sharing data with China's security apparatus. Last month, Telecom Slovenia began to roll out its 5G network. It expects to have one-third of the country covered by the end of the year. Now for a U.S. update on Chinese espionage. Assistant U.S. Attorney General for National Security John Demmer said earlier this week he was aware of 50 instances in 30 U.S. cities where Chinese espionage had recently been reported. He added that the Chinese consulate in Houston, which was recently ordered to close, had long been on the FBI's radar. That's because they suspected it might be a base for Chinese efforts to steal U.S. intellectual property. Demers said U.S. prosecutors will resume work on cases related to Chinese involvement in digital hacking. The U.S. has designated the Confucius Institute Center a foreign mission of the Chinese regime. That's because it advances Beijing's global propaganda effort and harmful influence on American schools. The Trump administration has designated the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, or CIUS, as a foreign mission of the People's Republic of China. The Confucius Institutes have come under increased scrutiny recently for spreading propaganda and suppressing free speech at U.S. schools. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo stated the Chinese regime has taken advantage of America's openness to advance large-scale and well-funded propaganda and influence operations in the U.S. Pompeo said the State Department is recognizing the CIUS for what it is, namely an entity advancing Beijing's malign influence campaign on U.S. campuses and K-12 classrooms. After the designation, Institute staff will be required to register and submit their personal information to the State Department. They will need the department's approval when purchasing or renting houses in the country. The State Department said the designation isn't asking for closure of the institutes, but it will add pressure on their host schools and universities to rethink whether to keep them. The CIUS claims it supports the teaching of Chinese language and culture in the U.S. But the education advocacy group National Association of Scholars has a different perspective. The group says Confucius Institutes avoid teaching about human rights abuses in China and portray Taiwan and Tibet as undisputed territories of China. And it claims the institutes educate a generation of Americans who know nothing more about China than the Communist Party's official history. Currently, there are 75 Confucius Institutes in U.S. universities and hundreds in K-12 classrooms. Pompeo says the foreign mission designation will help school administrators in the U.S. decide whether these programs should be allowed to continue and, if so, in what fashion. The designation is the latest move by Washington to stand up to Beijing's aggression, which includes attempts to export its ideology, undermine Hong Kong's freedom, and expand its insecure 5G network. 
The Securities and Exchange Commission is investigating China's version of Netflix. The Chinese streaming service has been accused of fabricating sales numbers and the amount of users it had. Company shares plummeted on the news. NTD's Phil Zhou has the details. China's Netflix-style streaming service, iQiyi, is being investigated by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Wolfpack Research reported in April that iQiyi inflated its 2019 sales revenue by up to 44 percent, or almost $2 billion. The financial research firm says iQiyi exaggerated the number of users it had by up to 60 percent. The report goes on to say that iQiyi was, quote, committing fraud well before its IPO in 2018 and has continued to do so ever since. In iQiyi's latest press release, it says the SEC is seeking financial records dating back to January 2018. The company says it had 105 million subscribing members as of June this year. iQiyi expects a 6% decrease in total net revenue for the third quarter. Company shares were down 14% as of Friday morning. Chinese coffee chain Luckin Coffee collapsed earlier this year because of fraud and has been delisted from U.S. exchanges. We spoke to Wolfpack Research. They said GSX, a Chinese tech education company, is probably the next to fall because of fraud. Reporting by Phil Zhou, NTD News. A Chinese jewelry group, King Gold, saw its shares plunge almost 30 percent on Wednesday. That's after the company announced it would voluntarily delist its shares. The plunge means King Gold shares on the Nasdaq have lost 60 percent of their value. Just two months ago, the company found itself in a scandal. In June, Chinese media reported King Gold obtained an almost $3 billion loan using fake gold bars as collateral. King Gold is one of China's largest private gold processors. The company chairman denied any wrongdoing. It said the delisting decision has to do with factors such as cost and the company's financial situation. Now we take a look at Wall Street. American banks earned a handsome sum in fees from Chinese companies in the U.S. and Hong Kong this year to the amount of over $400 million. That's almost a 25 percent jump compared to a year ago. Bank fees earned from Chinese companies are sizable, accounting for over 40 percent of the total fee pool. Among the banks, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are the top earners. The enormous fee pool is now at stake as the Trump administration released plans to crack down on Chinese firms not following the audit rules. If Chinese firms don't open their books to U.S. regulators, they would be delisted after three years. An extensive virus testing set to target all Hong Kongers will begin in two weeks. But three Chinese agencies with ties to the CCP have been authorized for the undertaking. Some are speculating that the move is a Beijing effort to collect Hong Kongers' DNA under the banner of virus protection measures. Hong Kong is now facing its third CCP virus outbreak. Its chief executive, Carrie Lam, announced last week that voluntary virus testing will be introduced in two weeks. But suspicions are rising that the Chinese Communist Party will take the opportunity to collect DNA from Hong Kongers in the name of epidemic control. Hong Kong pro-democracy activist Joshua Wong criticized Carrie Lam in a tweet for granting the nearly $20 million project to three Chinese labs without proper bidding procedures. The three facilities are Sunrise Diagnostic Center, China Inspection Company Limited, and Prenetics. Among them, Sunrise Diagnostic Center is a subsidiary of BGI, a Chinese genome sequencing company known as the Huawei of the biotechnology industry. Back in July, two of BGI's subsidiaries, Beijing Liuhe BGI and Xinjiang Silk Road BGI, were added to the U.S. entity list. The sanctioned companies on that list may not be able to export certain products to the U.S. The two BGI subsidiaries are sanctioned for their involvement in China's human rights crackdown in Xinjiang and for collecting DNA data from the Uyghur ethnic group there. Veteran Hong Kong lawyer and Civic Party chairman Alan Leong says virus testing has caused great anxiety among Hong Kongers. Hong Kong's people feel anxious about the proposal, mostly out of deep distrust of the government and the CCP. Companies with ties to the CCP are used as tools to set up a database of all 7 million Hong Kongers. After the regime's national security law took effect in the city, 10 Hong Kongers had DNA samples taken while detained by police on July 1st. 
Lawyers have questioned whether the move goes beyond the needs of the investigation. Some suspect the police are paving the way for a DNA database. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. Now to Taiwan, where on Thursday, three aides to local lawmakers were charged. The three allegedly tried to send sensitive information from Taiwan's government to the Chinese regime. The information includes Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen's medical records, internal documents from Tsai's party regarding presidential elections, and internal police documents, which reportedly detail local activities organized by groups Beijing deems anti-CCP, like Falun Gong. The three were indicted for developing a spy network in Taiwan between 2012 and 2015 and for accepting money for it from the CCP. According to prosecutors, two of the three traveled to Macau in 2012, where they were recruited by a Chinese intelligence official. Upon their return to Taiwan, they successfully recruited the third. Taiwan's National Security Agency estimated in recent years that there were approximately 5,000 CCP spies on the island. But there may have been more operating in Taiwan. Tension between the U.S. and China continues to build on the oceans of the Indo-Pacific region. On Thursday, China's military said it conducted exercises near Taiwan. This came a day after U.S. Health Secretary Alex Azar's meeting with Taiwan's president, the most senior Washington cabinet official to visit Taiwan since 1979. Taiwan's foreign minister told CNN this week that he worries Taiwan could become the next Hong Kong as the CCP always needs to find a scapegoat whenever it's facing a domestic crisis. Taiwan's representative to the U.S. said that the country is in talks with Washington to purchase coastal defense missiles and sea mines. Analysts say some recent moves by the U.S. are sending warning messages to Beijing. On Wednesday, the U.S. military said it has deployed three B-2 stealth bombers to an island in the Indian Ocean, close to the South China Sea. A Forbes columnist this week pointed out that a thousand-mile cannon the Army is developing may play a key role in case of a military conflict between the U.S. and China. According to a report by U.S. think tank RAND, the super-powerful strategic long-range cannon will be able to reach major Chinese cities including Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou from allied countries, including Japan, South Korea and the Philippines. With Taiwan's increasing strong military stance towards Beijing's threats, we met up with the Epic Times China editor Annie Wu to find out more about the situation and what it might mean for the future. Hi, Annie. Thanks for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Hi, Tiffany. Nice to be here. So why did Taiwan's stance towards the CCP become so much tougher in recent years? Yes, so um, in the recent years, uh, pretty much since uh, Tsai Ing-wen came um, into office after she was elected in 2016, um, Beijing has uh, been more uh, aggressive toward Taiwan. Uh, the party where she's from, uh, Democratic Progressive Party, is traditionally um, more uh, anti-CCP and uh, has also, in previous years, advocated for uh, formal independence from mainland China. So Beijing itself was also very aggressive toward Taiwan, and um, Tsai Ing-wen, seeing that uh, there is more uh, of a threat from Beijing, uh, she did not back down, and she um, kind of became more vocally uh, against the Chinese regime and their uh, threats toward Taiwan government and Taiwan society. And so in, in these years, um, there is more of awareness in Taiwanese society that uh, the Chinese regime has sought to infiltrate Taiwan society in order for um, Taiwanese people to be persuaded into accepting the idea of unification with the mainland. Um, and especially uh, in 2019, when uh, there were mass protests uh, happening in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwanese people saw that Beijing's tightening grip had such a, a powerful impact on people's freedoms and uh, Hong Kong's autonomy. And many Taiwanese people came out in support of the Hong Kong protest movement and realized that um, you know Taiwan could be next if we allow Beijing to keep uh, infiltrating and um, kind of keeping its hand on local affairs. So uh, in, in the lead up to the 2020 elections in Taiwan, many people saw that Beijing was 
uh, more aggressive and decided to uh, vote, um, you know, by a landslide for Tsai Ing-wen versus the more uh, Beijing-friendly uh, candidate from the Kuomintang. Right, so you mentioned Hong Kong, and so Beijing recently imposed a national security law on Hong Kong, and the world has been noticing how Beijing has stripped Hong Kong of its autonomy and freedom. And like you mentioned, many think Taiwan could be next. So what does that mean for Beijing's goals in Taiwan? Yes, so uh, the Chinese communist regime has sought to influence uh, local politics, to uh, get more pro-Beijing politicians elected into office. It has sought to infiltrate local uh, trade associations to uh, foster more economic ties with the mainland, and in so doing, uh, kind of incentivizing closer relations with the mainland. Uh, it has done this for many years now. Um, and in recent years, there have been more attention on the way uh, people who are working on behalf of the CCP have sought to uh, steal trade secrets from many of Taiwan's top tech firms, such as uh, chip making companies. And so um, many people are actually uh, poached from Taiwanese firms as well uh, to work for mainland Chinese companies, uh, offering you know, a much higher salary, uh, more financial benefits. And so there's also a so-called brain drain from Taiwan. And so uh, people are uh, realizing that the Chinese regime's ultimate goal is to have more Taiwanese people accept unification with the mainland uh, under the Chinese Communist Party. So the U.S. has been taking a very hardline stance towards the CCP. So what kind of effect does that have for Taiwan, who's an ally? Yes, so uh, the United States has recently escalated uh, s tension with uh, the Chinese regime, uh, being more uh, hardline in terms of sanctioning Chinese officials, um, uh, not allowing certain Chinese companies to operate in the United States, and uh, generally uh, uh, raising awareness about the Chinese Communist Party's threats to uh, the whole world. And uh, it sees Taiwan as a key ally in the uh, Indo-Pacific region in that Taiwan is an open democratic society uh, that realizes the threats from the Chinese regime and is uh, on the United States uh, side in a way. Um, so this is kind of like a mutual um, beneficial relationship in that uh, the United States sees Taiwan as a key ally in promoting democracy and um, universal values of freedom uh, to the world and allowing Chinese people to see that uh, a democratic society is possible for them. And Taiwan also sees uh, the United States as a key backer, um, not just in terms of um, any business ties or um, the U.S. as its main uh, arms supplier, but also uh, being aligned with um, understanding the Chinese regime's threats. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Annie. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Tiffany. Now we turn to questions submitted by our viewers. One question asks about the significance of lightning striking buildings in China and if there is a tradition behind that. So there is a belief in China. Traditional Chinese culture is deeply influenced by Buddhist and Taoist thought. Buddhist teachings often associate lightning strikes with the idea of karmic retribution, while Taoism considers them a form of heaven's punishment. Chinese folklore believes that only those who have committed enormous sins and will stop at no evil will be struck by lightning, a consequence brought down by heaven. For instance, according to the records of the grand historian, the arrogant emperor Wu Yi of the Shang Dynasty was stricken to death by lightning. That emperor was known for being disrespectful to the divine and often insulted the heavens. Following his rule, the Shang Dynasty went into a period of decline. In other contexts, the Chinese idiom struck by lightning is often used to swear people in or make solemn vows. That's why when significant structures are hit by thunder and lightning, it's seen through the lens of Chinese culture as a major event. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you next time.